Uh, a big thanks to Siddharth for coming here. A welcome, Siddharth. Thank you. Um, at very, very short notice, <coughs> we, we heard that he's speaking uh, at another forum this weekend, and I said, Siddharth, this is, can we do this? And uh, that forum was very grateful, but was very nice to us to let him, let him, <laughs> let, let him, let us share him. And Siddharth agreed to come, even though he's, his voice is uh, <laughs> uh, not so good. Uh, I've known Siddharth for a few years now, known of him, met him several times and read about him, read his stories online, really, which he shared in, on, on blog pages and online. And uh, he's been a new source of inspiration to me and to a lot of people uh, who we know jointly and you know in the community in Pune and elsewhere. Just in brief, Siddharth's story is that, and I'm going to let him share most of it, but just what, what I understand of it is that you know he was somebody who was living a, a life kind of on India's Wall Street, uh, being a, 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 a TV presenter, analyst, and living a, a sort of mainstream sort of life. And in a way, he had, he had it all, uh, but there was this question inside him that maybe this is not enough, and I'm, of course, that's what I thought about it. And he sort of gave that up and, and started living at the, at the Gandhi Ashram for, for, for four years, met wonderful people, different people, and, and did a lot of different things. And sort of life has brought him back to where he started, and he started this company called Sacred Capital, and we thought it would be amazing for him to show the story with us. Thank Thanks so much. Sir. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'll try and speak at the loudest possible tone. Uh, if at some point my voice just gives up, gives up uh, and then we'll figure out what to do. Um, but thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, can you? Yeah, yeah, no worries. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good to go. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, as Kushru mentioned in his introduction, I spent a few years at the Gandhi Ashram. So the title of my talk is something uh, you guys will probably uh, appreciate. Um, and that's what this journey, that's what Sacred Capital is really about. Um, it's a story of my experiments with wealth. I use the word wealth. I don't use the word money because I feel wealth has a much broader um, capacity. Um, I heard somewhere that the word wealth derives its its root, its meaning from the word well-being, as in, in Latin they're very well uh, closely connected. And so that made me think, you know, yeah, maybe that was the original purpose of wealth. Um, but it's so ironic today; it just holds the absolute opposite meaning. You know, like money can't buy happiness, and all. Oh, you know, if you're rich, you're invariably not happy, and you know those kind of conversations. But two questions, what can, can wealth and actually um, be aligned with each other and two, what is true wealth? Um, the answer to which I don't know, but my life is about a series of experiments in that direction. Um, and so I thought of sharing some of these experiments with you. Um, and that's where we'll begin. Um, like I said, wealth today. Um, means a bunch of different things. Um, this, interestingly, is a photo from just last week on 2nd March at, at, a, at an auto show in Germany. I don't know how many of you saw this. Um, but that's actually a Volkswagen and that was the, the, the head of sales for Europe for Volkswagen. Um, and he was actually rolling out the latest Volkswagen and the latest features. And I don't know how many of you were aware, but last year Volkswagen had a major scandal uh, breaking out. Um, for those who, who you do, wouldn't, don't know too much, um, regulators in the US found out that the emissions levels were 40 times that of the norm. And that's a massive scandal. And they had basically installed a little cheat software, uh, which you know allowed them to bypass the regulations. And this broke out. Um, Volkswagen, the company, nearly went bankrupt. In fact, it's still struggling with a lot of charges, a lot of complications. And of course, the world wrote about it. Everyone was really upset. But me, as an you know, as a financial advisor, I was actually sitting back and thinking, 
wow, this is Volkswagen. Um, this is not like some businessman in Ludhiana who's frauded somebody. Uh, like this is one of the largest, most reputed companies in the world. Um, and this is basically what happened. Um, and it made me sit back and question, wow, what's going on with the world today? How do we actually navigate some of the developments in the world? Um, and in fact, last week, I come back to this photo last week at, at the auto show, there was this little prankster, Simon Brockwell, his name is. He actually broke onto stage as, as, the, as the head of sales was speaking and he tried to install a cheat software, a little joke, and he came on with a Volkswagen coat and he was doing this little skit. And so, very embarrassingly, that guy, the, the head of sales actually had to chase him down and, and, sh and escort him off stage. Um, and so it is a, it's a really funny video <laughs> that maybe you guys could YouTube. Um, but these are questions that are coming up in today's world when we're speaking about wealth, when we're speaking about companies, we're speaking about organizations. Um, of course, for me, a lot of these questions began with Lehman Brothers in 2008. 2008 almost became like the symbol of all things wrong with Wall Street. Um, and for someone like me who you know went to business school, and I remember when I was in business school, it was a time when uh, the whole India Shining campaign had begun and capital markets had begun to uh, deliver value to, to our country in the form of malls and shiny new roads and infrastructure. And for me, capital markets, financial institutions were the bearers of all these good things. Um, and so at that point, I remember I was heading, running one of India's largest trading desks. Lehman Brothers was actually one of our biggest clients. And for me to come in to work on 15 September 2008 and hear that, sorry guys, Lehman Brothers is bankrupt. And it just makes you wake up and think, you know, what's going on? Um, these again were not small organizations. Um, and the funny thing is the world is so hyper-connected um, that a, small, a sneeze here in California or in New York actually ripples out into a large-scale viral fever across the world. Um, and so this, this talk is not about, you know, the evil people on Wall Street or, you know, what's going on at Goldman Sachs. There's enough documentaries about this, there's enough movies, there's enough uh, information about this, there's enough activism, uh, which is probably good around this. Today's talk is not about that. Uh, but to explore what next, uh, and that's a question that a lot of people have been asking and we frankly don't have too many answers. Um, so I'll begin with my story and this, I shared a little bit about it, Kushru spoke about it. Um, it was, yeah, that person in a suit looking pretty serious um, and um, a lot of that fell away when some of the developments that I spoke about transpired. Um, Again, too many questions, absolutely no answers. Um, and a lot of that questioning made me literally pack up my bags and head to the Sabarmati Ashram. Uh, at that point, I remember coming across the works of Gandhi, coming across the works of several other people who've spoken about the potential or ideals that men could or man could hold. Um, came across people like Sheetal and Kushmita at the Irvin Ashram. And for me, it was a quest of finding what next. Uh, like I said, no answers. Um, and so literally, I quit work and spent about five to six months basically just reading, traveling, visiting different communities. And I remember coming across um, the Sabarmati Ashram in around beginning of 2011. And it was one of the few places, like every other non-profit or spiritual community or ashram that I visited, every community would be like, oh my God, here's an IIM grad, like, let's, you know, can you make a PowerPoint presentation for our fundraising? Can you make, you know, these Excel spreadsheets for us, for our working capital? Um, and I was happy to help, but it didn't feel like, you know, true exploration. Um, but in the Sabarmati ashram, one of our very dear friends, Jayesh Bhai, said something very interesting to me. Um, he said, Beta, teen char mahine ke liye apka laptop band kar do. Like, so shut down your computer for a few months. And I found that really odd. Um, it made no sense to me because how could I help? You know, this is all I had been trained to do. Um, 
and then to actually switch off my laptop meant I didn't know what else I could do. Um, but some very interesting things happened. I think the Gandhi Ashram for me was this beautiful ecosystem of non-profits, of different communities, rural and urban and tribal. And for me, it just became a time where I could just spend time with my hands, um, doing some really, really minor things. Um, spending time with people like Vasan Kaka, Kanti Kaka, Gopal Dada, who've been very, very senior Gandhians, um, who've spent time understanding different ways of expressing their life. Um, I spent time, some days just cleaning a toilet, or some days fixing a roof, washing dishes, helping the kitchen. Um, um, human manual way scavenging, um, a lot of people were like, Siddharth, why are you doing this? You're an IM grad. Perhaps I was, uh, but for me just to bend down and do something with my hands in, in non-intellectual ways was a way for me to learn. But more than anything, it gave me time to actually understand the minds of some of these people. Uh, to dive into the philosophies of people like Vinod Bhavir, Gandhi as well, um, some of the senior Gandhians that I mentioned, Ishwar Kakaya, who's um, run a san an organization for sanitation that's built more than a mil half a million toilets across India. Uh, all of it done in a way which was extremely counterintuitive. Um, all of it came in a way which was led with service was really just a way for me to understand myself. Um, why was I washing these dishes? Because it gave me insights into who I was. It gave me insights into what my values could be. Um, and, and I believe that was the crisis I was going through. I didn't even understand what my values were. And these tiny experiments allowed me to connect and dive deeper uh, into my own self. Um, and apart from you know all of these things in the evening, there was this beautiful space there called the Seva Cafe. Um, how many of you have heard of the Seva Cafe or been to it? So Seva Cafe is a very interesting experiment. It's, it's a cafe that's run by volunteers. It's a mainstream rest. I mean, it's on a mainstream road, run six days a week for dinner. And volunteers run this cafe every day. Guests who walk in are told, you know what, this, this meal has been offered to you as a gift. You choose what you'd like to pay. And what you pay allows you to keep this experiment running. And the moment I heard, the moment I stepped into this, um, there was this radical side of me. I tend to be very radical. This radical side of me just was, you know, wow. Because it was so counterintuitive to my trading floor, right? So on one end, I had been trained and spent five, seven years on a trading floor. On the other hand, there was Seva Cafe that was the exact opposite, which was just like trusting people and being generous and, and, and having faith in this process. Um, it was so counterintuitive that I was very drawn to it. And... Before some time, for about one and a half years, I ended up running the space, um, which for me was a fantastic experiment because, you know, you can run the balance sheet of a company, but to run the balance sheet of a Seva Cafe, it's the complete, like everything I learned in IIM, I had to let go of uh, in Seva Cafe. Um, and it's in very, very minute ways, you know, months where you go through a bad patch, you think of cost cutting because that's what you learn in business school. But I soon realized that in Seva Cafe, the moment you try to cut costs, the moment you try to develop more control, it actually spirals down into shutting down. In fact, in Seva Cafe, you need to actually let loose even more and like pour even more love into your food. So experiments like this gave me, I would say, an opportunity to understand very, very radically different mindsets. Um, of course, for me, it was the complete opposite of my capitalist world. It was like the anti, uh, the antithesis to money. Um, my experiments range from trying to live with as many few clothes as possible, trying to spend as little money as possible. Um, and Sheetal and Kush have seen me in these phases where I'd be walking around this kurta and a very long dadi, and I'd be philosophizing and talking to people about some of these ideals. Um, in fact. I, some friends towards the end of you know, my stint at Gandhi Ashram actually pointed out, you know what, Siddharth, you're more obsessed with money now than you ever were. Um, and that was kind of funny because I was obsessed with money in the opposite way and that I wanted to run away from it as much as possible. Um, and all of these conversations made me think. Um, and a lot of credit to some of these men you know, who I've spoken, spoken about. Um, but amongst all of this, there was this very, very interesting man here, Raghu. Um, 
and you never i mean there's no book about him there's no no real articles nobody's really you know spoken much about him in that sense a very very ordinary man he was um but he ended up being one of my closest friends in the gandhi ashram um as you can see he had polio in both his feet um when he was 20 he decided to leave his village and come to ahmedabad literally with 200 rupees in his wallet um and ended up through a series of serendipitous events at the gandhi ashram and at the gandhi ashram you know you think look at a guy like him with almost no family background almost no physical body to speak of you think he would sign up as a beneficiary to all these programs uh, but instead he actually signed up to volunteer and to actually run some of the programs for the other communities again that was so counterintuitive to me that again i was so drawn to him because for me he became an extremely inspirational brother or friend to have <coughs> and i remember conversations with him where i'd be going through fears and insecurities about money and here was this dude like literally you know i don't think he had more than 4 or 5000 rupees in life uh, not even a physically able body but he'd be talking about his next project to deliver lunch boxes to old ladies or to like deliver tulsi plants to people in the slum or take care of kids and run some you know program for them i don't know what kind of fuel he was running on but a very interesting you know conversation i had with him i remember it was in in early 2013 um early 2014 um he actually called me one day and said siddharth bhai like i want to spend some time with you and chat with you um and i said fine i'll just come over i'm coming over to the gandhi ashram anyway um but instead he said you know what i don't want to talk to you at the gandhi ashram let's go some place neutral uh i didn't know what neutral meant um but we I, we ended up at a barista and i guess these days a barista or a starbucks is as neutral as it gets and it was really odd because you know never seen him outside the gandhi ashram context um the whole cafe was staring at us because we were such an odd couple together but i remember him for the first time talking to me about him wanting to get married um to have kids to have a home um he had fallen in love with somebody and he wanted to explore a relationship with that woman um and in my head there was this pedestal that had placed him on and in my head that story was crumbling and i remember trying to grasp onto it and saying no ragu you are my hero um you can't be talking about these mundane things um and as i started thinking about it i said wow there's something wrong with that thought process um to think that i could only idolize somebody who could live a life like gandhi or could only think about service but i remember that conversation with him then um made me wake up and think about what idealism really meant um how it represented you know holding this aspiration but still being very very rooted in the real in the very very mundane um and very sadly almost a month after that conversation he passed away in a very tragic accident um and the whole world you know was speaking about how great a hero he was because by then he had actually become very famous abdul kalam you know had felicitated him he was being called for talks all over the country but i actually oddly remember him from that conversation um and to me that represented a very real heroic version of raghu uh, and that conversation left me thinking it left me questioning what idealism really was what values really were how they could be rooted in like i said in the mundane in the everyday world um and that started a process within me um for about 4 years like i said i completely disconnected with money um and i started having this urge like almost like a calling of sorts to say you know what i want to re- reconnect with my world of finance <laughs> Uh, there was this analytical side of me the laptop like let's call the analytical side the laptop or the computer and i had an engaged with it in a very long time um and so i had kind of resisted the urge and said no no sadar you can't sell out um but after my conversation with ragu something within me felt like you know going back um and going back and expressing my values what i'd learned in the gandhi ashram in my context um in what was my world um and 
engaging again with wealth in a way. And so in very, very small ways, I tried reconnecting with my world of finance. Um, I started thinking about my wealth <coughs> and as opposed to shoving it away in an Excel file hidden away on my laptop, I actually looked at it again and questioned what wealth really was. Um, and I remember doing this little chart in, I think it was May or May of 2014. Um, and I actually said, you know what, maybe wealth is very, very broad based. Uh, what if we decide to give it that wholesome, holistic expression that it needs? And of course, when I say money today, you think of like very material, financial expression of money. And so I actually said, you know, before Gandhi Ashram, what are the things I was doing? Um, and how wealthy was I? And so I actually made a little chart of how wealthy I was in 2010. And of course, because I had been a banker, I had a fair amount of financial wealth. And I said, what about the other kinds of wealth? What about intellectual? Um, what about social wealth? What about cultural, experiential wealth? Uh, and these are things that I'll speak about later. And then I said, okay, let me reassess where I am at 2014 and see how wealthy I was. I expected I must because all I've been doing is hanging around in an ashram and volunteering. Um, but very oddly, um, like you look at this and it just intuitively it says like that I'm much wealthier, right? Um, and of course financial wealth had been depleted, not too much because I was living a simple life. But when you look at some of the other kinds of wealth, um, look at the different ideas that I held, look at the connections that I'd made in my community, all of this had actually multiplied uh, as a result of my life in the Gandhi Ashram. Um, and that made me think about what it would look like to actually broaden wealth into a more diverse spectrum. Um, and so that kind of gave rise to this question, you know, can I reconnect with finance? Can I try and bring a different definition for money, for wealth? Uh, like I said, wealth was connected to the word well-being. So what would it mean to actually bring harmony between those two words. What are you um, defining as subtle? Uh, I can talk about that later, but subtle I would define as the ability, this is my definition, the ability to just be happier with something that's inner. Um, for example, in the Gandhi Ashram, I, you know, living in Bombay in back seven or eight years ago, I needed like several pairs of clothes um, and a fancy car, a fancy house, to, for a certain amount of validation. But somehow life in Gandhi Ashram was radically different, you know, living on two pairs of clothes gave me a certain amount of validation. Um, of course, I needed different kinds of validation, some, but I would define subtle capital as something, maybe an inner satisfaction, an inner happiness, which actually lets us be more content on the inner inside. Um, and, I, and I'll share a little bit more at a later stage. Are you I, could, I mean, it's probably the same thing. Uh, I try not to call it that because I, I think spiritual sometimes means different things uh, to different people. But you could say spiritual, I guess. Um, so coming back to this world of finance, um, obviously we spoke about some of these things. Uh, you know, there were these large-scale uh, calamities of sorts. Um, all of us know about this in the last seven or eight years. Some of the biggest crises crises in the world have been related to the world of finance um, and to which we actually don't have a solution. Um, and that's made a lot of us question, uh, especially in the last two years as I've begun this journey with Sacred Capital, the questioning has been, how do I bring these ideals? You know, that conversation with Raghu is always in my head, you know, how do I bring those ideals but, but manifest them in a very, very real world? Um, and I remember at that time, I began, like I said, these conversations with myself, uh, where I was exploring wealth um, in these ways. Um, but I also began having some of these conversations with some very close family and friends. And when they started having conversations around wealth, rather than you know launching into a speech on idealism, you know, I actually engaged in a conversation with them, and that gave rise to some very, very interesting co relationships. Um, earlier, you know, as a trader, as a broker, I was always very, very vested in, you know, commission, very, very vested in trying to earn revenue. But sitting out of the Gandhi Ashram and having these conversations with people, it gave rise to some very authentic conversations. 
um, and that along along with that at that point i remember regulators made a very very radical shift uh, um, and came out with some very interesting changes um, so they looked at you know some of these situations we all know about what lehman brothers did uh, and they said you know what for for decades financial institutions have been the guardians of capital in a way um, for decades you know for any kind of flow of capital in the world we've had to rely on the lehman brothers the hsbcs the city groups and regulators said you know what we'll try and monitor these guys but we'll hand over the onus of financial capital to these guys um but clearly post 2008 a lot of regulators had been waking up and saying you know the government had been waking up and saying we need to do something about this and that gave rise to some very very interesting changes um and in the us in 2011 in the uk in 2012 and in india in late 2013 and in, in late 2014 governments and regulators started carving out this role of what we call the fiduciary um now the fiduciary is a very fancy sounding word but it basically means this somebody who has the fundamental obligation to work in the best interest of you um and this is not something out of this world it exists in society today when you think about lawyers when you think about doctors uh they are your fiduciaries so when you have a court of court you know have a case to be fought in a court of law um even if you're a terrorist you can approach a lawyer and you can say you know i would like you to be my fiduciary and the lawyer in spite of who you are is bound to work with your best interests in mind um when you are unwell you visit a healer or you visit a doctor and in spite of again who you are uh, in spite of you know um what your ailment is uh, a doctor is bound to work with your best interests a doctor is not allowed to be earning commission on the side a doctor is not allowed to be uh, selling chem- you know medicines in order and, and 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 selling things to you and so regulators said you know what let's create the role of the fiduciary in a way as i came down to the studio i was looking at the books here looking at the office and i felt like the architect also is a fiduciary he's the one you know if you have a space to be designed you approach an architect and the architect is somebody you you consult uh, as a fiduciary and so regulators said what is that parallel for the world of finance uh, they actually didn't exist a fiduciary in the world of money which is very odd because money is something that actually affects all of us on a daily basis and so regulators all over the world started inculcating and started creating regulations for the fiduciary um and they gave some very very simple definition definitions to it uh simple rules for this the first was that as a fiduciary um you cannot be selling things to people um and that makes sense so today a lawyer or a doctor is not going to be selling things to you as a fiduciary you are bound by laws of confidentiality so today even if you are a terrorist a lawyer is bound to hold your information in confidentiality and third there must be sanctity of advice uh, so i remember those days the first picture that you saw me on cnbc you know broadcasting information on stocks um you know it was advice that was dispensed but i didn't know who was receiving it. it could have been a housewife in pune it could have been a financial analyst on wall street um very often you're on tv and you're just saying things because you know it's too embarrassing to not sound wise um and what i realized what was that there was no sanctity to my advice i remember in my head days you know in india even if you go to a shaadi or you go to a funeral people come to you and say can you give us some stock tips and you actually let loose stock tips because you want to come off come across as impressive um but when i heard about some of these regulations it made me think wow like what would it mean to actually to actually bring sanctity into my advice and so regulators actually brought a lot of responsibility around this role um and it's called different names it is in, in india it's called the registered investment advisor in in the us it's called a financial planner and in the in the uk it's a different name but in essence it's this it's that entity that is bringing that is working with your best interests in mind and i remember working with all these family and friends out of the gandhi ashram um and i and i remember they 
they were requesting me to formalize some of these conversations. And that's when I heard about some of these, reg you know, these regulations and I said, wow, this actually makes sense to me. Um, and so I actually began practice as a fiduciary. Um, and initially it was just me, it was just me sitting in one corner of Bombay um, and, you know, giving advice to people. Um, but what I soon realized was, was that it was giving rise to a very, very different way of designing. Um, so far, we've always been associated with money must go to financial institutions. You know, these institutions on our behalf will manage our money, invest in stocks, invest in bonds or deposits. But now as a fiduciary, it allowed me to engage with people in very, very different ways. Um, and that's something I'm going to speak about. But a, a key facilitator in all of this was technology. Um, I remember as the head of India's largest trading desk, I ran something known as a Bloomberg terminal. The fees for a Bloomberg terminal were almost 10, 12 lakh rupees a year. And with a Bloomberg terminal, I had access to information all over the world uh, at my fingertips. Um, but as I came back to Bombay and started developing my own systems, I came across systems that were extremely robust and extremely cheap. Today, I operate a system which is as powerful as the Bloomberg, but cost, cost me only $5 a month. Um, and that allowed me to start connecting with information in a very, very different way. So sitting out of my little room and little office in Bombay, it allowed me to access information, access analysts, access people all over the world in very, very low cost ways. And it started giving rise to very, very new designs. Um, and slowly people have been talking about this. Um, I've written a little bit about this. I'll probably you know, dive into this if we have more time at the end. But it gave rise to newer definitions of wealth. It gave rise to newer ways of organizing, um, which we hadn't really seen before, or we considered very inefficient before. So here's the 20th century paradigm that all of us are familiar with. You know, this could be a financial institution. This could be an HSBC, a JP Morgan, an HDFC. Um, these institutions are monitored by regulators. Um, and they obviously have a hierarchy in place. So you have your MD, then you have your VPs, your managers, your senior managers. And on the, f and on the street, you have the relationship manager who knocks at your door, calls you when you're in the middle of a meeting and asks you, know, asks you to buy certain products. We're all familiar with this. Uh, these, are some of, these are some of the models that we've also been very disillusioned with. But today, technology, today, some of the the designs that regulators have been promoting have allowed us to engage with assets in very, very different ways. Um, and that's, I would say, what's been emerging the last couple of years. In my opinion, this is what has been giving rise to some of the designs in the coming years. Um, and in a way, it was the founding principle of sacred capital. Um, and I frame it very simply. I say it's what we're trying to do is foster a more authentic engagement with wealth. Um, I mean, too many of us have been brought up in a 20th century paradigm where we were told, listen, you are incapable of managing your wealth. You must hand it over to a money manager. You must hand it over to a Warren Buffet uh, because they know what to do with wealth. And so all of us have kind of led a very, very passive role with our wealth. All of us have gotten used to saying, you know what, I don't understand what's going on in China, I don't understand what's going on in Greece, or I don't know what Volkswagen is doing. Um, therefore, here, here's my money and charge me a fee and just tell me what return I'm on at the end of it. It's kind of like, you know, saying I don't know how to cook my food and therefore I go over to a McDonald's or a KFC because it's so efficient. Um, now, those models work fantastically well in the 20th century, um, but we all know the problems with eating food at a McDonald's on a daily basis. Um, I may not, I'm not here to tell you the problems associated with it. Um, but just like in food, like in food now we're seeing a very active movement towards being more connected with what we're eating, um, being more aware of what the source of our food is, being more engaged with our food. So some, you know, I think we now realize that the healthiest food is what's made in our kitchen or grown in our backyard rather than, you know, coming from the potatoes in Idaho in the U.S. And that's a parallel that we're seeing being applied across. What does that parallel look like for the world of finance? What does it mean for you as an individual to say, 
this is who I am as an individual, this is what my needs are, this are these are what my values are, and how can I nurture assets that are reflective of who I am? Uh, how can I be more engaged in this process of nurturing my wealth? This was not a possibility maybe 50 years ago or 10 years ago or even 5 years ago, but today with the regulations, today with technology, all of these paradigms are now becoming a reality. And that's made me um, think through my designs. Um, so as I come back to this world of finance, you know, there's peers who are telling me, Siddharth, you should you know, hire five, ten people under you and then make it 500 and then 5,000 and then 500,000 and you can be just like the next HSBC. But I think the point is we don't need another HSBC. Um, and so it, it's, it's shaping my thinking. And this is my, you know, the result of my experiments. These are results of my thought processes, which I'd like to share with you. How can we think in more non-hierarchical, distributed ways um, for wealth? What would it look like? And so how can, you know, me as a fiduciary allow individuals here to engage with their wealth in more meaningful ways? Um, and so that's given rise to some very, very interesting designs. Um, of course, on one hand, you have individuals that we've been, that, you know, I've been working with. On the other hand, you have organizations that I'm far more engaged with. Um, but the core of it is to help people understand their wealth in more meaningful ways. Um, and which is why, as opposed to being the money manager, I've had to shift my, way, my process into being more of a facilitator. Um, as opposed to somebody who's, who's giving out stock tips, as opposed to somebody who, who's holding the key to like amazing research, I've had to shift my emphasis into somebody who runs facilitation programs or education programs, and which is why we run something called the Catalyst Program, in which you're helping individuals unlock capacities and engage with their wealth in more meaningful ways, allowing in individuals to regain this lost potential to understand what kind of assets they should be nurturing. Um, so whether it's an Infosys, you know, I don't judge an Infosys or a Reliance, but I'd like you to know what an Infosys actually does. Um, or whether it's, you know, a new startup that's, that's cropped up on a crowdfunding camp platform, or whether it's a new entrepreneur in your own neighborhood, can we actually help you understand what kind of assets you should be nurturing? And more importantly, understand that all assets aren't the same for all people. In fact, each person goes through a very, very different process. Each person must have a different set of assets. Each person must foster a different set of currencies um, through which the assets are nurtured. And how do we actually build that capacity within individuals? Uh, and that's a question that I've been holding for the last year or so, and which is why a lot of us now are moving into this direction a lot of us are asking people to play a more active role um, and asking individuals to think about who they are as humans. Um, today, almost every single individual that comes to me isn't asking questions of only roti, kapra, makan. I'm not saying that that's not important, but I'm saying every human is saying, what more? How can I find work? that is meaningful, but at the same time allow my wealth to be in alignment with my values? How can I do something that's meaningful and yet provide a more wholesome environment for my daughter? And this environment isn't just sending them to the next international school, but actually creating an environment, allowing her to, uh, allowing his daughter to engage in a far more, um, engage with, with some amazing organizations, entrepreneurs, and so it's almost like humans have all gone through this evolution where they're asking more of their wealth. They're all saying, you know what, I'm not just satisfied with the fancy car and the fancy home or even just the basic home and the basic car. I actually want more. I want to figure out how my wealth can, can align with my values. Um, I ask, you know, there are some individuals who will say, I don't like an ITC because they sell cigarettes. Can you find me organizations uh, that are doing work for the environment? Can you find me organizations that are doing work for... Um, for maybe for agriculture? Can you find me organizations that are doing work in recyclables? Can you find me organizations that are doing work in media? And this is now a possibility because we're not talking about Siddharth who's managing wealth for all these people. We're talking about networks which allow wealth 
to flow through. And so now the onus is on you as individuals to step up and say, this is who I am and this is what my wealth should represent. And through this process, we understand that each individual has his or her own sets of needs. Um, and that process actually leads to assets, which I like to you know, equate to trees. You know, assets are not just one cell in your Excel spreadsheet, but they're actually living, thri thriving ecosystems. And how can, actually, how can you be part of these ecosystems over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years? Um, so that's also meant, if we're asking individuals to step up, it's also meant we have to change all the metrics that we use. Um, and I don't know if we have time for that, but some of the metrics go beyond just return and risk, but go into far deeper conversations around, you know, how engaged are you with your assets? Do you, you know, while a Volkswagen might be a great organization um, on paper, we actually didn't know what was going on in Volkswagen last year. And so while a Volkswagen was you know, any business school would teach you that a Volkswagen was a very safe investment. The truth was we didn't know what was going on. And so one of the metrics we develop for portfolios is how engaged are you with the companies? Um, we live in a world of transition and there's all kinds of transition that we're experiencing. On one hand, we don't know if we'll be in Pune today. We don't know if we'll go to Oroville tomorrow or to Delhi or to San Francisco. And therefore, certain amount of our wealth needs to be fungible. Um, what do I mean by fungible? If we actually pack bags and transplant ourselves into another city or another country, can we actually take some of this wealth with us? Uh, while social capital is not very fungible, financial material tends to be fairly fungible. And so we started de de designing metrics which allow individuals to measure this. Um, there's another kind of disruption prevalent in the world today where 100 year old organizations, 100 year old companies are now being replaced by simple apps. And so while you might invest in a Tata Group company or a very reputed company that's been in operation for the last 200 years, um, the, the garage next to you where there's a bunch of kids designing an app can actually ensure that this com the 100 year old company becomes redundant. So how do you start navigating some of those, uh, those challenges? So these are metrics that we've started designing. Uh, and to be honest, it's all emerging. Um, to be honest, m you know, designs like these allow us to define different metrics for different individuals. Because you're not pooling assets, you're not aggregating assets, you're not managing assets for billions and trillions. You're actually facilitating a more wholesome engagement with wealth. And so my purpose is to actually educate you to answer these questions. My dream is that one day, you know, maybe six months into the Catalyst program, you'll be absolutely able to run and navigate these questions around wealth yourself. Um, and maybe five years, ten years from now, when we start seeing newer definitions for wealth emerging, you'll actually be able to navigate them across the spectrum. You start saying, you know, wealth is not just financial and material capital, but um, social capital, cultural capital, and you'll actually have currencies for some of these things. Uh, maybe even for such for subtle capital. Um, I don't think that's too far away. I think it's actually just five or seven years away. Um, the technology is here. It's just that we as people have lost the ability to engage with wealth. And if you ask me, that's the sole principle behind my work. It's the sole principle behind my own experimentation with wealth. Today with my own wealth, my experiment is actually to hold lesser resources in the banks and in financial capital form, but actually pour more and more of my wealth into my experiments and today my experiment is sacred capital. Um, and so these are experiments that I'm trying in my own way. Um, and I would say um, I, th these are experiments that we encourage um, in our journey with other individuals as well. Um, so Kuchru, maybe we can leave it open like a little interactive session with Q&A. Um, I've said quite a lot um, and I know some of those things you might have questions on a few things um, and we can you know, take it forward from here. Do you intentionally leave out health as capital? It's a good thought. Um, in my, classic classic level. Yeah, um, I, so I thought about and I kind of framed it as natural capital. Uh, I don't know and if that's environment, a good... Environment, right? Uh, environment but then at, 
through one argument and discussion I had with somebody, I actually framed even me as part of the environment. My body is part of the environment. Um, and so, in the Gandhi, spending four years in the Gandhi Ashram, I actually became richer in natural capital because I was breathing fresh air and doing manual labor and had a healthier body. Um, but this is just, like I said, all of this is emergent. I'd, I'm actually, you know, I'd welcome conversations on this. This came because I read an ancient book which had eight forms of Lakshmi. Um, and very interestingly, one of the forms of Lakshmi, you know, a thousand years ago was progeny or children. And it's very interesting to note nowadays when I have conversations with people, children are liabilities uh, because it means we have to spend on their education and their, you know, their, for, their visits to the U.S. And, and setting them up. And so it's very interesting to see how um, how these paradigms shift. But that's where this, you know, this came from. And, I, and it'll be nice to maybe speak about. It. it seems like you have a few thoughts on this, and I'd love to discuss it um, as well. Maybe first there, and then you could. You know, yeah, I like your example about the MACD which you gave that it's best to learn the cooking rather yeah. than just going because, uh, you know, yeah. with food as the evolution <coughs> is happening, people are, you know, much aware yeah. of what to, but wealth seems to be, uh, I'm a professor, I'm a doctor, yeah. but this wealth is one thing which is neither taught in the uh, education system yeah. and it uh, seems to be a very wizardly sort of thing for us. Yeah, yeah. So I want to ask you, like this was a very interesting food for thought, what yeah. you spoke, how to engage with wealth. We yeah. feel just keep it in the banks and put in FDs and all, but how to use it in a given lifetime. Yeah. So uh, my question to you is, uh, like we are attending one thing today, but yeah. this is a sort of thing which needs a constant inspiration, talking, yeah. discussing. Yeah. So yeah. what are your future plans for uh, uh, in so, this direction? Yeah. So I get your point and I think a lot of people, as I started writing and speaking about this, people said, this is great Siddharth, now what? Um, and you know, there's just one of you and you're sitting in Bombay, what are we supposed to do? Um, and so I feel like the design for my organization has been for addressing some of your questions. Um, so first, rather than you know a very hierarchical organization, I'm thinking in terms of a network. Um, so it's not just me, but it's an ecosystem that you'd be engaging with. Um, technology today allows us to engage with people irrespective of geography. So today only 20% of the people I work with are in Bombay. Um, only 60% are in India, there's people all over. Um, and so I think technology uh, has basically made geography history. Um, and so coming to your question, how do we engage? I would say there's levels. And so what we've been doing internally is creating an engagement spectrum of sorts. Um, so at one level, you could be very loosely connected and just stay connected through talks like this or through blogs that I might put up or you know, future forums that we would have. Um, we call them local chapters in different cities. Um, a slightly deeper way would be to maybe work in something that in the Catalyst program that I spoke about, which is fairly loose. You know, it's like a once a month Skype call. Uh, more deeper engagement is a family office, which is like far more hands-on and far more in-depth. So these are different ways in which you can engage. Um, and in both ways, you could you know either want to learn, you could either say, I'm actually, you know, quite passionate, I would like to contribute, uh, and even that's welcome. And so, I'm, I mean, some of that I've put up on my website, and maybe I can share with you later, but there's different ways for you to engage. As much as possible, we're trying to institutionalize it, so it's not just me talking to you and, you know, conducting a classroom course, but stuff that we're putting up online, so you can even go through it, and therefore, conversations can be, you know, far more meaningful. Um, and so this is stuff that I'm very actively designing um, and I understand your query which is why over the last 12 months this is how I've been giving shape to things. Um, and so I think at the end of the day the key is this, how can, how can each individual be connected to his assets but I understand that it's very tough for you sitting here with your full time job to know what's going on in Volkswagen. And therefore, an RI role, I mean, it could be sacred capital, it could be somebody else, it could be that fiduciary that I spoke about. The f role of the fiduciary is to help you connect with your assets in more direct ways. And so, my role is to constantly keep you updated on, so say for example, one of your assets included Volkswagen. My role would be, you know, my platform's role would be to highlight, oh, this is what's happened in Volkswagen last year and this is what we have to do. And today, technology allows us to do this at a much larger level, um, in much larger levels than you can think of. 
Fall. Ja. So I would say Gandhi for me, I mean, I don't consider myself a Gandhian, but very inspired by his thoughts, his ideals, obviously. Um, and some of his thoughts have given shape to this. I would say, you know, this is not stuff that you learn in IIM. Um, this is stuff that I learned in Sabarmati Ashram. Um, Gandhi spoke about the concept of a Mahajan. Um, and he had this very interesting theory. He said, in any village, the role, you had a Mahajan. Of course, today the money lender or the Mahajan has a very negative, you know, connotation to it. But he said the role of that Mahajan or the money lender was to foster circulation in that community. And he said in any village, if any Mahajan played his role well, you'd see good circulation and as a result, you'd actually never see extreme accumulation of wealth. you never see extreme poverty or extreme uh, uh, accumulation. Uh, it's kind of like in the body, like whenever there's a swelling in the body, you say let's increase circulation and the role of blood and oxygen is in a way. So I feel designs like this are more suited towards um, circulation. I would say today as a fiduciary, I see myself as a Mahajan. My role is to foster that circulation. My role is to ask people, what is the role of money in your life? And can you look at money as a facilitator? Not money for money's sake, like too often, you know, we tend to assume that more money is good. Um, more money is not bad necessarily, but I think we have to question how is it facilitating what we are here to do. And today an RI, a fiduciary allows you to do that. And so I would frame trusteeship in that way. A trusteeship in a way was to look at money as a facilitator. So whether you are an organization, how do you engage with wealth in a way which doesn't compromise your values? If you are an individual, how does money allow you to do what you are here to do? Um, and in a way this conversation has been, you know, I, I would love to see this conversation being pushed forward in a 21st century context because I believe Gandhi's adaptation of that was very appropriate for the 20th century. And today I feel very blessed because there's a lot of senior Gandhians, I don't know if you know of Satish Kumar, he's visiting us in, in Bombay and I'm the, in April and we're actually doing a discussion on trusteeship in the modern context. Um, and these are conversations that I very actively want to pursue. And here's the cool part. I think trusteeship coupled with technology, coupled with some of these designs, allows us to think of ways, you know, of think of possibilities that we never imagined. Because earlier you just had a Mahajan in one village and no accountability and no one knows what he did in that village, which is why the corruption came in the first place. But today technology can connect Mahajans from across the world in a very, very decentralized way. Um, so I think today things like the internet, things like more decentralized platforms are allowing us, like why am I here today? I'm basically here because maybe sometime I wrote a blog or some email circulated and now I find myself here. And so it's allowing us to truly question trusteeship uh, in a very new way. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Right? They're not farmhands anymore. Yeah. So therefore it's not relevant. Yeah. So 
all our concepts should they need to evolve with the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, today, for example, in, in, in many advanced parts of the world, there's a big fight between people who want to interpret things that were said four and five centuries yeah. ago yeah. in a very literal way, yeah. as opposed to people who yeah. want to adapt those things yeah. to today's yeah. definition. Uh, so that's one comment. The question I have is kind of different. You're talking about being connected with your wealth in the same way as we are connected with the food, with our bodies, everything. Yeah. Good point, no question. However, we always reach a limit where we give up our responsibility for what's happening in our body because we don't know. Yeah. And then we go to a doctor. Yeah. Similarly, there were years when I did my own taxes and yeah. then there were years when I needed a CA. Yeah. Where I just didn't know <coughs> how to do my own yeah. taxes. Right? Mm. Today's financial world okay, is infinitely more complex yeah. than it was even 10 years ago. Yeah. Right? How do you marry the, the extreme complexity and the increasing complexity yeah. of today's financial world yeah. with the limits of the knowledge and the time that an individual has? Yeah. So where does the engagement begin and end and where does it become necessary for yeah. a, a, a yeah. true expert yeah. to step in? Yeah. Yeah. No, very well. Sorry. Uh, very valid question. Um, I would say 10 years ago I wouldn't know how to answer that question or I would answer it very differently. Um, because 10 years, ago, 10 years ago if I was trying to do this, I would say Siddharth can work with maybe 50 people. But today technology is allowing us to engage with much more people. Um, so just the fact that technology has brought costs down, it's brought more robustness in our engagement. I mean we know this today. It's doing things that we never anticipated it could be doing. Like five years from now, we have technology driving cars. Like, you know, forget simple things. Um, and so this conversation would not have been possible without the help of technology. That's, that's one. Um, and so the systems that we've, des we've been designing allow for your concern of whether or not you can stay on top of things um, to be managed with very, very minimal inter engagement from me. Um, so while in the first month we might engage every week, by month number five we'll actually be engaging only once. Beyond that, just emails will be... So it's allowing me to automate, it's allowing me to create systems which actually don't need my, my dependence. Um, and so that's, I would say, a huge plus. Like we are underestimating how much that is really possible. So, so today you mentioned, you know, gave a panel with the CA. In a way, I am still like the CA. I will still be hand-holding you through this process. It's just that my active involvement won't be as much as it was needed five years ago. <coughs> and two, so I would actually say <coughs> the world of finance is not complex. It's been made to look complex. Um, it's almost like the secret to staying healthy is to eat decent food and exercise. Um, you, might some, you might have someone tell you that this great protein powder infused with vitamins and super nutrients is what's good for you. But in honesty, eating great food cooked fresh is probably the secret to good health. And I think the same parallel exists with money. Uh, you don't need to go in for those funky derivatives. I mean, I was... I was like the head of the largest derivatives desk, so I know what derivatives are. And nowadays you realize you actually don't need these funky things because if you have simple concepts of right and wrong, risk and return, um, you don't need to go through those capital guarantees and clauses and derivatives. And um, Simple asset allocation can help you design portfolios that are extremely robust. And what I realized was when I'm not incentivized by commission, when I'm not incentivized to have you buying more and more exotic things, my advice to you actually becomes very simple. Um, and so that's why I think it's actually not that funky. Um, I actually, so, and so literally in the communication that gets sent out to clients, a fiasco that would normally have occupied half a newspaper would be sent out in three lines. 
uh, or calamity in a company would basically just be two lines saying this is what's happened if you want to read more this here's what's there but this is what we think you should be doing and that's automated which is why we can engage with more and more people in very in very in new ways um, it seems like you have a re related question no 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 did that answer your question yeah uh, thank you. yeah Secret capital is engaging in a, in a new model yeah. and in a new relationship yeah. between people who want to do something yeah. with their money yeah. and about how that advice should be given. Yeah. And moving away from the traditional models of, of uh, wealth managers yeah. who were incented to push product yeah. at you, yeah. uh, which was not necessarily good for you, yeah. just because. They yeah. made money the more yeah, volume yeah. or the more exotic yeah. products, they made more money. Yeah. So we understand the, the commercial model <coughs> of the yeah. old type of fiduciary. It yeah. was not really yeah. a fiduciary, yeah. 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 Okay, but a scam artist. Yeah. Right? So what, what you see as the financial models mm -hmm. with which the new fiduciaries should engage with their clients, yeah. Because obviously the new fiduciary also has to make some money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think but my days of volunteering also over. Uh, but so what are, yeah. uh, what are those different commercial models yeah. that you yeah. think are fair to both sides? Yeah. So um, there's different levels, and related to your question, at one level, very loose engagements don't necessarily need financial engagement. Um, I mean, in that way, you're paying me with your presence, you're paying me with your ideas. There's comments coming up. In a way, I'm learning from that. At a deeper level, um, regulators mandate that I operate just like a lawyer. So today, if you would appoint a lawyer or you would appoint a doctor, um, the same way I would work with a fiduciary on a pure advisory fee. Um, in some, in in more deeper ways, it's it's linked to the assets that you have in some of the uh, deep ways it's it's a monthly uh, subscription fee of sorts that you would offer uh, but these are ways things that I have been working with over the last 12 months um, there's a lot of trial and error that's happened uh, and which is why I've been very because individuals have been very patient but I think that's the way to go like this is a new model that's emerging um, yeah This model, yeah. uh, as it gets more established, yeah. the regulators are going to come in also and start to try to put some control, sort of... Yeah. Right now there's no control on that. Right. Yeah. So, how do you see that evolving in terms of <coughs> regulators uh, either certifying these kinds of RIAs or, uh, yeah. or controlling the, the commercial yeah. models in which yeah. they operate and things like that? So, as of now, I am a licensed certified RIA, an investment advisor. Nobody, if if I say I'm an investment advisor, I must be licensed by SEBI or the SEC in the US or FCA in the UK. And that's the law now. So if anybody is saying they're an investment advisor, it's, it's kind of like the equivalent of a doctor now. So I am licensed by them. Every year they audit me. And so that means I have to maintain a record of all my advice dispensed. That's very different from me. See, because now that advice. Um, initially, I was a little wary. I was like, "Wow, this seems kind of big brotherly." But to be honest, it's brought a lot of sanctity to this role, um, and I don't see any conflict so far with the way I want to practice. Um, they don't mandate. They don't offer any uh, mandates on the amount of fees or how to fee, how to charge. But they have created beautiful structures for grievance redressal. So if you feel there is malpractice on my side, you simply have to write into an email ID and highlight you know, any malpractice from me. So in a way, it's brought about a certain amount of ethic, a certain amount of accountability. Sadly, nobody knows about this. Um, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, the regulators on their part, they've done this, um, and they're trying to do the best they can, but they're regulators. Um, I think the change eventually has to come from people like us. Um, and there's about 200, 250 odd investment licensed advisors in India now. Um, but probably just three, four, five of us practicing in this way. Um, 
I'm, and, and that's because it's tough. Um, because, I mean, I was sitting in Gandhi Ashram with virtually no expenses, which is why I could experiment with these things. I do understand a lot of advisors struggle with it. And so now my conversation has branched out to other advisors who want to work in this way. And so I'm saying, let's pool our research, let's pool our entrepreneur networks. And that's where scale will come. So your question of, you know, how many people can you really engage with? I think scale comes in a very decentralized way. So eventually there would be, you know, hundreds of advisors like me in the UK and US working with people across the world. And we would pool resources. And that's where we would get scale. And so technology allows us to pool resources. So are you building the technology platform that enables yeah. this yourself? I mean, we have it. Um, I feel very, con very confident um, and also because technology is moving, you know, allowing so many more amazing things and in very cheap ways too. Yeah, Kushru? Uh, so then I, can, I can sort of visualize you working with Gandhi Ashram and from what you said and from what I've read about you uh, as to why you would take a, you know, a, a step away from your old life, you can yeah. say, and you know, try to find, ask deeper questions and yeah. look at your life uh, mm. afresh, in a sense, which is what you did. But was there a moment or was there, uh, my question is, what, what brought you back to sort of your roots again? In, in your learning, in your in your education, in, in what you were doing before and to look at that in a different way. Mm. Um, I'm sure there must have been times when you felt, okay, I just want to throw out my whole life, I'm gonna re, re redo my life, you know, and not go back into capital markets or yeah, yeah. Uh, so what was that after four years that brought you back into this uh, So initially it was like I said, you know, this desire to reconnect with my analytical side. Um, I have always enjoyed that. Um, I've, in Gandhi Ashram, I think I stepped away from it very actively. And I was feeling this calling, you know, I was, as I was reading mainstream news again, I was seeing some of the, you know, the, the horrendous things that were happening in the world of capital markets. And I felt very called to, wow, like, I'd love, you know, this is actually just a very, there's a very simple solution to this, and this is how people should be navigating this, and this is how I should be navigating it. And initially, there was a lot of resistance because I was like, am I selling out? Am I going back to, you know, the big bad world and uh, selling my soul to the devil again? But that's when I realized, you know, I think that's the baggage that wealth has, has gotten associated with in today's world. In, in a gathering just like this, a few months ago, somebody said the taboo word of the 20th century was sex. The taboo word of the 21st century is money. And today, when anyone says anything money, we just think of something really bad associated with it. And so I had to battle that. That was my biggest battle. Um, the way I navigated it was to take things extremely slowly. Um, like I began work on sacred capital probably at the time when I had that conversation with Raghu, which was two years ago. I didn't register sacred capital until last month. So it took me like 18 months just to even register the organization. Um, while I did get my license, I went extremely slowly, like till date I have not done any soliciting for clients because I want to move into this very, very gradually. Uh, it's only now that I'm actively talking or blogging or, so it's taken me like 18 months um, to gradually flow into this because at each stage I wanted to be very, very certain of what I'm doing and you know this world, it's fraught with obstacles. Um, and seducing agents, so you have to be very careful. Um, and I mean, she, I mean, my friends also know this. I've kind of gone on under the radar for the last 12 months, uh, largely because I wanted to be very, very sure of this new world or this new mod model that I was trying to build. Um, so personally, yeah, there still is fear. Um, I don't want to be selling my soul, um, but so far I feel like I'm really enjoying work on a daily basis. I'm really finding that deep alignment with what my values are and what I'm trying to manifest. So whether it's, you know, individuals here uh, or even organizations that I am actively engaging with, um, just on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm just having a lot of fun. Um, and I guess the truest testament of that is, yeah, for me, can money just be the facilitator? So in that sense, not doing this for the money, but just because I enjoy it on a daily basis. Uh, can we take her and then?
think it is obvious to all of us that technology is an enabler. Yeah. But when we look at the base of the technological progress, yeah. I personally find yeah. that it is creating another brownical class yeah. by itself. <laughs> so yeah. I was just wondering, do you envisage a time or a period yeah. when the populace yeah. will be so familiar with technology yeah. so that it will enable better distribution of wealth? Sure. That's my question. Um, that kind of brings did me... You my question? I, I think I did. Um, I think it's related to this. How, how many of you have heard of the Bitcoin here? Yeah? And invariably, it must be some pretty nasty things about the Bitcoin, how it's like this black money currency and like... Uh, so... Popular mainstream magazines uh, you will find. And I'd say it's, this is not so much about the Bitcoin, but I would say it's about the technology behind the Bitcoin called blockchain technology. Um, so you guys must have heard about Napster, right? Like in the 1990s. Uh, before that, music was always held on CDs and tapes. And, and then Napster came around and all of a sudden we discovered, wow, music can just be shared peer to peer. And <clears throat> Napster shut down two years later because, you know, of certain, uh, I mean, a few houses ensured that it was shut down. That technology actually went forward and today we use music in very, very peer-to-peer -peer ways. The Bitcoin is like a money world. Um, it's technology, blockchain technology has allowed us to create a decentralized consensus for the ledger. What does that mean? Today we go to a bank and we deposit our money in a bank account. We pay an ICICI bank a fee because that money is safer there than at our homes. And so ICS Bank has hundreds of thousands of employees, all this technology, all of this you know, capital to ensure our money is safe. In effect, that work can now be done by the blockchain technology. The blockchain technology was introduced by an anonymous person in Japan who left it open source and just published the paper. And so today, we have the technology to design wealth that is truly peer-to-peer. -peer. We have the technology and I've been chatting with a few people in MIT and in Massachusetts who've been designing open source systems which allow us to maintain records of wealth in a peer-to-peer -peer measure, in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Which is actually very scary news for financial institutions. Um, which actually means in a few, year, few years from now, I think, the business of banking will actually become redundant um, and that's what um, some of these articles were about um, because in essence a simple server or an algorithm can do the work of a bank so the potential now exists for us to create wealth which is truly unfettered which is truly uncontrolled whether that happens or not I guess it's up to us um, it's up to people like me as advisors to step up and say yeah you know, can we work as trustees? Um, so I feel the potential, either way, in the next five, seven years are going to answer a lot. Um, and which is why for me, the programs like the Catalyst program and new ways of working are becoming very important because the only thing holding us back is our ability to engage with that. And so I'm already having conversations with people where we will be able to design alternate forms of health. Uh, in the US already there are 4,000 alternate currencies, um, there are already platforms are available where we can design our own currency. So for example, <coughs> with a company that's creating recyclables, we're talking about environment friendly dollars. Within sacred capital we want to issue integrity dollars. And so um, five years from now we won't be talking about wealth purely in the form of rupees and dollars, we'll be talking about wealth in the form of apple dollars. and integrity dollars and subtle capital dollars and and that sounds really funky and very like sci-fi but technology for it is actually here it's about whether or not we wish to uh, introduce this into our lives and so communities will start having their own currency you'll start seeing pockets of wealth which are unlinked from wall street but all of this is only possible if we step up 
um, and do it. So to answer your question, I think it's possible, but um, it's possible only if we decide to manifest it collectively. One thing I doubt is that even if the trust is the base of all things, if the trust is not there, then the whole system will come. Whatever the system. So I feel one way to design for trust is to introduce more resilient designs. If you looked at that first graph chart where I showed you, you know, one sneeze in one part of the world meant the whole world collapsed. We've created a money system which is hyper efficient, but it's not resilient. And so which is why if somebody sells bad loans in California, our mortgages here get derailed. But when we're creating systems for trust, we have to create resilient systems and which comes to your question of creating decentralized networks. Um, I have a few thoughts on that, but that's actually several chapters long, so maybe we can discuss it at another time. But I hope to write more on some of these things. I feel like the missing piece is a desire to create trust-based systems, not the technology for it. Um, let's go with him. Yeah, I want to oh, ask sorry, how much time do you have to shoot? Uh, tomorrow also you are giving a talk from 11 to 1. Yeah. As we uh, got in the mail and what is the content of that? So that's slightly different. Um, <coughs> Kushru requested me to keep this more about my journey. That will be more about some of these questions. How do you actually go about designing these assets? So that means understanding different metrics. Um, and the thing is we are not familiar with these metrics because we've been used to money management metrics. Um, so some of these questions. Who am I as a human? What kind of dashboards should you be creating? Um, and it looks a bit scary, but it's not that scary. Uh, but some of these things is what we'll be diving into tomorrow because it's a smaller group and a more in-detailed um, process. And so some of this engagement spectrum also is what we will speak about tomorrow. Um, yeah. So, did you guys have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it's in the email I think that Kushru sent out. Uh -huh. Secret capture. You have designed it as a not for profit organization? Million dollar question. So it took me 18 months to register it because I wasn't sure. I was like, not for profit, for profit, not for profit, for profit. Um, this is a question I actually do in my workshops with organizations. I think this definition of for profit, not for profit, let me answer it in a very management way, like around the bush. Definition of for-profit, not-for-profit was a very 20th century innovation. Um, we had for-profit organizations which just chased profit and obviously that created problems in the world and therefore we had people who said, oh my God, we're ruining the world, let's create a not-for-profit. Um, in a way, it's like the phase I went through in my first phase where chasing money and then running away from money. I think today we're reaching stages where we think of organizations more as ecosystems. Within ecosystems you have some engines which are very transactional, some engines which are more gift based, more compassionate, more nurturing and for those you can't have very transactional models. So if you ask me, I would say sacred capital is an ecosystem. Parts of it are very for profit um, and the way I try and I, as much as possible, I would disclose what my fees are, what it means to engage with me, what my, if there is any conflict of interest, can I disclose it? And parts of it are not for profit. Like, why am I here? In a way, just to share um, a few thoughts. Uh, why do I write blogs? Because, you know, it's my way of expression. Um, we have something known as a local chapter where people can, you know, be part of the ecosystem without any, you know, fee. And so there's different parts to the ecosystem. Some are like, like our body, like, our stomach is the engine, it's more transactional, whereas, you know, perhaps our heart isn't as transactional or different parts of our body aren't. So I would say, can we as organizations think in more holistic ways? Um, and so on paper, it is a for-profit company, um, but I think that I did that more for because it was less of a hassle. Um, but that's, that's how I would define sacred capital today. I also end up working with organizations 
Um, who think in the same way. So when you ask me, oh, are these organizations that we can donate to or, or invest in, I feel that's not the right word. Um, they are organizations that you want to engage with. Um, and so some of these, I mean, all these organizations exist because there's a purpose. They want to do something in the world. And every organization has to engage with money. How it engages with money is the secondary question. And so same way with Sacred Capital, what is my aspiration? My aspiration is to see a more authentic engagement with wealth. Of course, I engage with money. And this is how, I mean, there are different ways in which I do it. Um, so I hope that answered your question. You mentioned your website and your blog. So can you share it? The... Yeah, sacredcapital.in. Is it not? Oh, it's not here. Sacredcapital.in. And you just find Yeah, all of that you find on, on the website. I, I would like to um, make a, I would yeah. like to make a comment. Sure. Yeah. According to me, yeah. any organization, yeah. any relationship yeah. has to result in surplus. So instead of, you know, yeah. and you have already mentioned different types of resources. Yeah. So you see, you find that even a friendship, yeah. if it doesn't create a surplus of awareness of friendship, yeah, yeah. we end it. Yeah. Any organization yeah. must generate surplus. So I, I suppose you yeah. don't have to talk about profit. Yeah. Because your organization also has to pay yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would say it's like I came to Pune by car. Yeah. Uh, of course, I had to put petrol in the car to get here. But the point of me coming here was not the petrol. Um, yeah. Like it got it's, me here. It's like the added value yeah. to your yeah. saving yeah. 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 Any closing question? Yeah, last question. I think there are more and more models for companies uh, where they can try to balance yeah. Uh, is a plus objective. Yeah, yeah. With a social objective. Yeah. And I, and I think uh, the Section 8 companies are also one of the examples of, yeah. uh, of what we can look at yeah. as we try to yeah, look yeah. for different kinds of yeah. uh, models. Yeah. Uh, the other point I want to make is that uh, you talked about people wanting to uh, engage in this new area where the technology yeah. uh, is available to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm finding more and more that the, the financial system yeah. and the banks yeah. have actually come to a point yeah. where to get themselves out of the situation they're faced in today, yeah. they are taking actions which are actually automatically driving us yeah. to these models. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. In, the last, in the last year or so, yeah. we've had multiple countries, Switzerland, Japan, yeah, yeah. and other people to moving to negative interest yeah, rates. Yeah, yeah. So they think they're going to solve the problem yeah. of negative interest rates. So all they're going to do is get us all yeah. to take our money on the banks yeah. and look for yeah. Bitcoin or gold or yeah, yeah, silver yeah. or yeah. whatever. So, so they're themselves in the foot. Yeah. So, so this is why yeah, I, I think I'm at the stage us. where I don't have to explain to you that McDonald's is bad. I think we've all experienced the ill effects of eating McDonald's burgers. Um, the question is, if not McDonald's, where? Um, and so this is what... That's the challenge. Uh, there's enough documentaries on ill effects of, of financial there's institutions. There's a lot of broad-based innovation that's happening too. Rather than sort yeah. of create a class of people that yeah, engage yeah. with technology, I think quite the opposite is happening with the smartphone. Yeah. Where you have a pay PM that yeah, has yeah. six times as many yeah. accounts yeah. As, as, as the banks have. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I think these are all like the Napsters in their own way giving rise to newer paradigms. What that paradigm is I think will probably be in five to seven years. In terms of organizations, I think more and more organizations are realizing as opposed to knocking on the doors of VCs or you know some of these institutions, they'd much rather tap into the goodwill that they have in the community. And so we've been developing something called community funding. And so then the role of sacred capital becomes you know opening these channels to these organizations. Um, and so that's some of the work that we've been doing. And so I think it's inevitable. Um, I think it's just a matter of time uh, that we see this. Yeah. Kushru, should we wrap up? No, I think there are a lot of questions, even I have a lot of questions. <laughs> 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 I'm, yeah, up to you. I'm, uh, Any more questions for anybody that's already got up? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, you're welcome to write in, engage at Sacred Capital. I've been using that word so much, that, so you can't forget it. Uh, or just visit the website, 
secretcapital.in so that thanks so much thanks. for coming yeah thank you